Section 8 of Lives of the Ancient Philosophers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Ancient Philosophers by Francois Fenelon. Section 8 Periander. Periander, tyrant of Corinth, was contemporary with the preceding philosophers, but neither the year of his birth nor that of his death is precisely known. It is surprising enough that the Greek should have bestowed the epitaph of wise on one so weak in his conduct as Periander. They suffered themselves to be dazzled by the brilliancy of his maxims without reflecting on the atrocity of his actions. He spoke indeed like a sage, but he lived like a madman. He kept up a criminal intercourse for a length of time with his own mother, Cratia, without any apparent sense of his own dishonor in so infamous a deed. He made a vow one day that if he should gain the prize at the Olympic Games, he would erect a statue of gold to the honor of Jupiter. He came off victorious in the next games that were celebrated, but not having sufficient money to acquit himself of his promise, he seized all the ornaments of the ladies who had come elegantly attired in order to do honor to the festival, and thus performed his vow at their expense. Periander was the son of Cypselus, of the family of Heraclidae, and was tyrant at Corinth, his native city, at the same time that Haliates was king of Lydia. He married Lysus, the daughter of Procleus, prince of Epidaurus. He always evinced the most passionate attachment to her, and changed her name from Lysus to Melissa, which signifies in the Greek, from which it is derived, a bee. He had two sons by this marriage. Cypselus, the eldest, was dull, and indeed appeared almost deficient in intellect. But Lycophron, the youngest, displayed an elevated mind and was admirably adapted to govern a state some females from interested motives wishing to disgust periander with his wife melissa who was at that time pregnant related such calumnies against her as to excite in him the most uncontrollable jealousy insomuch that meeting her on the staircase immediately afterwards he gave her such a kick in the body as hurled her from the top to the bottom and destroyed at once the mother and the infant which she carried in her womb instantly repenting of what he had done and loving her to distraction he forgot even the respect due to the dead and throwing himself on the senseless corpse he committed outrages upon it for which madness itself could be no excuse he next wreaked his vengeance on the women who had inspired his suspicions, ordering them to be seized and burnt. When Procleus, the king of Epidaurus, was made acquainted with the horrible cruelty with which his beloved daughter had been treated, he sent for his grandsons, whom he loved to the utmost tenderness. He kept them with him some time to console him under his affliction, and when he sent them back, he embraced them and said to them, my children, you know the murderer of your mother. The eldest paid little attention to the import of these words, but they affected the youngest so powerfully that on his return to Corinth he would neither speak to his father nor make any reply when spoken to by him. Periander questioned Cypselus, his eldest son, very closely as to what had been said to them by their grandfather. But Cypselus, who had forgotten all that had passed, merely related the kind treatment they had received. Periander was, however, by no means satisfied with this answer. Conscious that something more must have occurred, he therefore pressed his son so earnestly to recollect himself that at last Cypselus called to mind the parting words of Procleus and repeated them to his father. Periander immediately entered into the full meaning that Procleus had intended to convey he now resolved to compel his youngest son to acknowledge his dependence on him he forbade any person to retain him under his roof lycophron thus driven from one asylum in vain endeavored to procure another his father's threats had inspired a terror which closed every door against him 
at last some friends took pity on him and received him at the hazards of incurring the displeasure of the king periander then issued an order denouncing the punishment of death on any one who should harbour or even speak with lycophron so rigorous a decree terrified all the inhabitants of corinth and no one was found hardy enough to hold any intercourse with the subject of it after it was issued he was shunned as if he had been some ferocious animal and his nights were passed in the porticos of houses in the course of four days he was nearly exhausted with hunger and misery periander seeing him at the point of death was touched with pity and went to him saying o lycrophon whether it is more desirable to drag on a life so wretched as you have rendered yours or to submit yourself to me and be made the master of all that i possess you are my son and prince of the flourishing city of corinth any disaster that may happen to you will be felt by me as keenly as if it had happened to myself but you have incurred all this suffering you now experience by angering him whom you ought to have respected you have now experienced the fatal consequences of opposition to a father's will and i permit you to return to your paternal roof lycrophon firm as a rock listened to this speech from his father and when it was finished he coolly replied you deserve that punishment yourself for speaking to me which you have threatened others with should they do so seeing that it was impossible to subdue the resolution of his son periander determined to send him out of his sight and accordingly banished him to corsaira a country subject to corinth periander entertaining the liveliest resentment against proclius whom he looked upon as the origin of the breach which had taken place between him and his son raised troops to make war against that prince and put himself at their head he succeeded in all his measures and having made himself master of epidaurus and taken proclius prisoner he retained him in confinement though he spared his life in the course of time periander finding age come upon him sent to corsaira for lycrophon intending to resign the sovereignty in his favour and to set aside his eldest son who was no way fitted for the cares of government lycrophon did not vouchsafe a single word in answer to his proposition periander who loved his son with the greatest tenderness could not bear to relinquish the hope of finally prevailing on him to come into his views he ordered his daughter to repair to corsaira thinking that her influence over her brother's mind might work more successful than had hitherto attended on any of his own schemes to gain over him as soon as the young princess reached her brother she made use of every argument which she thought most likely to move him and make his obstinacy give way would you prefer she said seeing the throne filled by a stranger rather than by yourself power is a mistress surrounded with suitors and naturally inconstant our father is now in years and his death cannot be far distant if you do not hasten your return our family will be lost dream no longer then of abandoning to others the greatness which courts your acceptance and which is your hereditary right lycrophon told her however that he would never return to corinth so long as her father should remain there the princess took her leave and acquainted the king with the resolution which lycrophon had made periander then sent a third message to him purporting that his son might take possession of the throne of corinth whenever he pleased as he himself had determined on finishing his days at corsaira to this arrangement lycrophon made no opposition and accordingly it was settled that the governments should be thus exchanged the corsairans however being informed of it conceived such a dread of periander's coming to rule over them that they killed lycrophon in order to avert the probability of it the death of his son plunged periander into despair he issued his commands that three hundred children belonging to the best families in corsaira should be seized these he sent to haliatus to be emasculated the vessel in which they were embarked was compelled to touch at samos 
the inhabitants of that city being informed of the cause which destined these unfortunate youths to sardis compassioned them and secretly advised them to take sanctuary in the temple of diana when they had once entered hither it was affirmed that they were under the protection of the goddess and the corinthians were not allowed to take them away without openly incurring the resentment of periander methods were devised to supply them with the means of subsistence every evening the young men and damsels of samos were sent to dance round the temple they were provided with cakes for the purpose made up with honey and threw them into the temple whilst they were dancing the children from corsaira picked them up and lived on them every day these dances recommenced and the corinthians at last wearied of beholding them returned home enraged at being thus disappointed in his attention to avenge his son's death according to his own fancy periander wished to terminate his existence but as he was anxious that no one should know the spot where his body might lie he devised the following contrivance to conceal it he sent for two young men to whom he showed a by-path and commanded them to walk there the next night at a stated hour to kill the first person they might meet and to bury him instantly having dismissed these young men he sent for four more and commanded them to repair to the same place and to kill and bury without fail two young men whom they would meet there walking together after this he sent for a number of others and instructed them in the same manner to dispatch the four and to bury them on the spot where they might fall having thus arranged everything to his mind he took care to put himself in the way at the time and place he had fixed upon and being met by the two young men whom he had selected for that purpose he was deprived of life by them as he had wished the corinthians erected an appropriate though empty monument to him and engraved on it an epitaph in honour to his memory periander was the first who was attended by guards and who changed the name of magistrate into that of tyrant a term at that period synonymous with king both signifying an absolute ruler periander did not allow his cities to be thrown open for the residents of all alike he was greatly influenced by the advice that thrasybulus who on a particular occasion wrote him the following letter i have concealed nothing from the man whom you sent to me i took him into a cornfield and i beat down in his sight every ear that raised its head above the rest if you wish to maintain yourself firmly on the throne you must follow my example put all the chief persons in the city to death whether friends or enemies an usurper ought to place no trust even in those who appear to be his warmest friends periander used to say that thought and labor would accomplish all things insomuch that it had been found practicable to separate an isthmus from the continent that no man ought to propose to himself silver or gold as the sole recompense of his actions that the great could have no stronger security than the affection of their subjects that no possession was more desirable than tranquillity he held it proper to punish not only those who actually committed faults but even those against whom the intention of committing them could be proved pleasures he observed are transient but glory endures for ever be temperate in prosperity and prudent in adversity never reveal a secret entrusted to your keeping let not the circumstances of your friends influence your attachment to them that ought to be the same in adversity as in prosperity periander esteemed men of learning he wrote to the most eminent sages of greece and invited them to come and stay some time at corinth as they had done at sardis and on their accepting his invitation he showed them by his reception of them and his mode of treating them that he wished by every attention of his power to make their residence at his court agreeable to them he reigned forty years and lost his life about the forty-second olympiad by some it has been imagined that there were two perianders and that the words and actions of both have been wrongly attributed to the same individual.
End of section 8